Greetings and welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel for another Making Things video. In this one we're going to make some bone needles. We're going to make two bone needles. The first of our two bone needles is going to be out of one of these little, often called needle bones, also called hawk bones. These occur in the front legs of ungulates, especially deer. Second, I'm going to take this, this is just a, a sliver of bone from an old project, just a little scrap, and we're going to make a larger needle out of this that could be used for null binding or, or needle weaving, which is classically today thought of as sort of a, a Norse <laughs> cultural attribute, but had a much wider distribution than that historically. It's something I want to learn, not something I know how to do now, but I'll teach you how to make the needle. Um, this size needle is also good for um, sewing with thonging, you know, if you're sewing uh, leather and you're going to use leather, th leather thonging to stitch things together instead of a thread or si sinew stitching. This size of needle is good because you have a nice wide flat area to cut a large hole to get leather thong through. So we're going to do two very different sizes of needles. We're going to use two very different techniques to make them both old and new, and hopefully you'll enjoy and learn something from it. So first let's look at our little naturally formed hawkbone needles. These occur, as, as I mentioned in the intro, these occur in the front legs of pretty much all ungulates. They don't occur in the back legs, interestingly enough, and they live right underneath the dew claws. So these two bulbous bits attached to the dew claws, and then these little strips go up into the main tendon and work to help the, the animal flex their foot. So they're really nice little <clears throat> naturally formed bone needles. You don't need to do much of anything to them. I show how to get these out in a recent video that we did taking apart the legs of a deer as part of a butchering process. So I will make sure that there's a link to that in the end screen at the end of this one if you want to see the whole story. Now because these embed into the tendon, they never come out clean. Um, so you just want to get them out, get them out as clean as you can, and then we're just going to take a box cutter here. Just kind of scrape off as much as of this tendony material as we can. Scrape and cut. We don't want to cut into the bone any. Just want to scrape all this tendony stuff off. Okay. There you can see it's not not a hard job. There's a reason that these things are used worldwide. It's because it's easy. Especially when you're talking about utilitarian tools. People like easy. Right? So, kind of scrape and cut that. And then when you get close, you can take a piece of sandpaper and use that to do the final cleanup. Okay. And just like that, it's all clean and ready to go. So when you're sizing up this bone and deciding where to, um, where to put the hole in it, think about the fact that pretty much all of these that we find archaeologically, the hole is somewhere down in the middle, usually about a third of the way down or halfway down. It, I mean, I'm not just talking about needle bone hook needle bone needles, but all bone needles, right? You find this, something this size archeologically, the hole's gonna be down here. The reason for that is that bone has grain, just like wood has grain. Unlike wood though, it's not strictly linear along the length of the bone, but the length of the bone is going to be stronger than the cross section, okay? The grain tends to spiral a little bit and follow the blood vessels, but the length is still stronger than the cross section. So you don't want to put your hole right here, okay? Now, 
when we think about making a hole in a material in modern time, if I say I'm going to fill in the blank a hole, you're going to, what word are you going to fill in the blank? Drill. Drill, right? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to drill a hole in this material. But historically, while you could drill a hole, there are ways to drill a hole without any kind of power tool, right, obviously. And even back thousands of years, you can you know, do a hand drill or have a pump drill or a bow drill, right? But it's pain. Historically, we want to make a hole in something, we're going to grind or cut the hole. So I want to show you that with this project, okay? So what I'm going to do, this is tricky to do on film, because I want you to be able to see it, but I have to see it at the same time because it's a very delicate piece. I'm going to take my little box cutter and cut a hole right where the swelling starts to go down to a slimmer profile. Okay. And this is just exactly the same as chip carving. Let's make a little slice. Now come back from it to both sides. I'm just cutting out a little groove. Okay. To do this, we have to come from both sides. I'm going to start on the side that's harder to do. And I do apologize that you can't see this a little better. You'll see it better when I do the bigger one here in the next clip. This is just such a fiddly little piece. see that coming in there. Okay, you get a nice oval hole working back and forth from both sides. This has a curvature. You want to be careful you don't push down on it too much or you just might snap it. I've never done one, snapped mm. one of these before. Mm. Just like you're never sarcastic. I'm never sarcastic. <laughs> That's why this is the harder side to work from, because it's against that curve. Okay. And I am basically through from both sides. It needs a little bit of cleanup yet, but that is basically the profile of this thread hole. careful and go back and forth and back and forth. Traditionally, okay. was this made by like a specialized person in the group? No, no. Um, this is not a specialist tool. Uh, this would be made <clears throat> there we go now that's all the way through okay this would be done by whoever had time to do it right whoever and this varies from culture to culture but whoever in the group was primarily responsible for butchering and processing hides would also process these bone items okay, okay? So in, in, in uh, Native American culture, this would probably have been the women most of the time. 
I think in um, Samai culture in Northern Europe, this would have been the men. It just, you know, the term it depends. Mm -hmm. Whoever is primarily responsible for processing the meat is also going to be making these source, sorts of household sundries from the meat and the hides, right? So gotcha. varies group to group. Uh, but this is not a specialist. This is not a specialist skill. This would be an everybody thing. Cool. Okay. Yep, yeah, that's through. It needs cleaned up a little bit, but you get the idea here. And I will do that when I'm not trying to go quickly and risking splitting it. <laughs> so um, now once you have your hole in, now you'll come back with, you know, finer abrasives and you can polish that off because you know it's going to be a successful one and not that one. You're sad when you do a whole lot of polishing and then this happens, mm -hmm. right? So... Um, that is a successful needle, and I'll polish it up and finish it up, and that just takes a lot of time, and it's repetitive. So, mm -hmm. but you can see, we have a nice oval hole, and this is what most of them look like, you from know, the from, from the archaeological and anthropological record, right? You have oval holes a fair ways down, so I know I'm not going to split up through that in use. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look at this one. As I said, this is just a sliver of bone left over from a past project. It's partially worked already, but we want to work it a little bit more. Now this one, I want a nice wide groove in, again, for leather thonging or for yarn, okay? Um, the tip is fairly nice already. I'm not going to do a whole lot on that, but I do want to show you how I make these in the first place. And step one is just to cut it out. Um, I like to cut these slivers of bone out with a uh, hacksaw to get them close. Then my favorite tool for working them down is just a common file, right? Just a nice coarse file and it works really well, okay? And this will cut very quickly and you can choose coarseness of file to de depending on how fast you want to remove material. When you already have it fairly close to a shape, you want to go with you know something like a bastard cut file like this one. If you're doing final smoothing, you would go finer. If you just have a very coarse cut, you would want to step maybe up and use something like a farrier's rasp. Okay? So files are my favorite tools for this kind of work. But, just to show you, you don't need a file. You can get something a whole lot simpler and do just as well. So, a couple days ago, I was just out for a walk in the woods, and I spotted this nice, flat, and pretty coarse piece of sandstone. And you can find something like this in pretty much every creek in the world. And we can use this as a fairly efficient way of removing material, okay, right, and you can find this anywhere. You don't necessarily need a file, and if you say, oh, but I'm watching this from an urban setting, I can't just go and pick up rocks easily like you just did, well, go to the hardware store and buy a cinder block. You can do this on a cinder block. It will work just fine, right, and I've made quite a bit of progress here just on this piece and if you're interested in these sorts of crafts keep your eyes open and it won't take you long to find quite a few pieces of stone that have a variety of coarsenesses the one downside to stone versus file is consistency within the material. Most sandstones are going to have some regions where they're coarse and some regions where they have a finer grit. And if you look at really old objects, you'll see, and you look at them really closely, you'll usually see a variety of depths of scratches. And that's a dead giveaway that whatever, whether it's wood or bone or anything else, that it was polished and sanded on a natural sandstone, that uneven grit. Okay, whereas sand, modern sandpaper and files have an even grit, so it all comes through consistently, right? But you know, if you look at you know even wooden objects that were made fairly recently for the tourist trade 
in I have a, a couple of boomerangs that were um, made in Australia for the tourist trade in the in the first half of the 20th century and if you look at them really closely you can see different sizes of grit so those wooden objects were brought down on this on, on a piece of sandstone right? mm -hmm. so you can um, it's a very distinctive appearance when you're doing something on this. Now, I'm not going to go too far on this. I just wanted to do a little bit to give you the idea and show you that, yes, this will give you a very good result. You can see how much more straight that edge is. Right? Um, but if you're going to do any of this inside, I would recommend that you do it wet. Bone dust that you generate from this kind of sanding is very bad for your lungs and is a silicosis risk. Okay? So I'm being very careful not to raise any dust here. It's just sitting on my sandstone. And I won't, you know, poof air on this and blow that away. I will go and wash it in a sink and wash it down a drain. Um, I prefer to work bone, when I'm doing bone work like this, I prefer to do it outdoors on a windy day just to reduce that risk. <clears throat> you can see it's a lot truer now just from that little bit of work on the sandstone. And I think that actually went faster than when I was puttering earlier with the rasp. Okay. So you have the tool options. Now, I can come in just like before and cut my groove with this knife. Okay. Right? And we can just carve our way down through. But again, what would you do without a steel tool? This is what you would do. Mm. I just went over to one of my buckets of flint flakes from the last little flint napping demo. Which is also, by the way, up on the YouTube channel if you want to see that. And pulled out a handful of flakes. Now I'm just going to look at these and see where do I have a nice edge for cutting in here. And right there, that edge kind of has a natural little burr in shape to it. So I can use that. Carve. And now instead of cutting a groove, I just have the triangle I want. And I'm just going to kind of use this like a graving tool and plow my way down through here. Okay. The downside to this is it chips quickly. Mm -hmm. So you keep having to move and use different sort of edges. but I am making progress. Now, while I'm doing this, let's think a little creatively. Here in Northeastern North America, there are very few flint resources. Okay, you can see that dust I'm plowing up. There's very few flint resources. It's not like the Rockies, where there's flints and chirps and agates under, under every bush, right? So it's hard to find good flint. So if you were in the woods and you wanted to do this and you didn't have a steel tool or didn't have a steel tool you wanted to sacrifice and couldn't find flint, what could you do? Well, I could go and I could chip some of this so that it, some of my sandstone so that it had a sharp edge and just sand my way down through. And just sand a groove, just worry it down. Now, those, those sharp edges on sandstone, um, or even quartzite, are going to wear very quickly. So you're gonna have to get a couple of strokes and then refresh your tool. And get a couple of strokes and then refresh your tool. So it's gonna take you more time yet, but, very doable. That's one of the reasons that
especially in flint pour areas, there's a lot more tools made out of organic materials than there are made out of <coughs> stone. Because I can work the organic materials with abrasives to make shapes and holes. I don't have to um, have the best of the best stone, which reserves the best of the best stone for other other applications where you need the best of the best stone, right? So this flake here in um, the Mid-Atlantic is much more valuable to a hunter to skin your deer out than it is to make this because I can chip a little piece of sandstone and worry this hole down through here, not as efficiently as with this, but I'm gonna destroy all of these flakes in the process of making that one hole, right? And then I have to go schlep somewhere and trade for more stone to butcher my deer. Whereas I can find sandstone and quartzite all over the place, you know? So you have a lot of tool options and really learning to master these sorts of skills, especially if you wanna understand it from the perspective of experimental archeology, span there's a lot of critical thinking, like what would I do in this situation not what is the best thing to do in all situations. So I'm gonna continue making this little hole and polishing up this little needle that I already started and I'll cut back and show you the final results. So we have completed this little project. I finished cleaning up this little needle and for a utilitarian item, that's the highest level of finish it needs. This is not something that you would take and go and do scrimshaw on, right? It's just not a big enough surface. There's no real ability to decorate that. We just have our cut in hole and um, a nice finished smooth piece so it'll go through the material well. So that guy's done. <clears throat> this could be decorated if you wanted to take extra steps. Doesn't have to be, but certainly could be. And we have the cut in hole here. I did a lot more with the uh, with the knife. That's what I did the majority of it with. I did do some more with the little flint burr in there. And I was having a little bit of difficulty with what I have here in front of me getting into some of the corners, so I grabbed one of my needle files. And that's, again, files are really, when I'm carving bone and shaping pieces of bone, the file is the tool I use more than any other. Right? So a good set of files is a wonderful thing but you have options as we discussed earlier. So if you have found this enjoyable, I hope that you would give it a good old thumbs up and I'm most grateful for that because it helps the YouTube algorithm know to show it to others. And I hope that this gives you a little bit of food for thought as well as project ideas because there's a lot that you can do with materials that people throw away and a lot that you can do with tools that most folks would not think of. You don't need as much as we think we need in order to make some nice objects. So with that, I'll let you go and I hope that you'll join us here next time at Old Ways Rising Farm.